And the reason I draw the parallels because I think that we are domesticated humans. I've talked mm. about this. We live in a human zoo and there are ways to step outside the cage doors. The cage doors are open. You could just, there are ways to do this, but it, it means bringing the ideas of how we've lived in the past into our quote, modern life. This week's podcast is a special one. I'm super excited to share my appearance on Heart and Soil's new podcast, which is called Radical Health Radio. What else would it be called, right? We found an amazing host, it's Steve. You'll hear us talking on the podcast this week. And we get into some really good questions. They had some great questions for me. And I really enjoyed hanging out with the crew from Heart and Soil. They're doing an amazing job with this podcast. So there's a ton of podcasts in the world, but I think you should check out Radical Health Radio. We've got a YouTube channel for Radical Health Radio on YouTube, or you can find Radical Health Radio wherever you listen to podcasts. But enjoy this appearance of mine on Heart and Soil's new podcast, Radical Health Radio. Like I said, we answer all kinds of burning questions. We talk about overarching issues, how I learn, how I think about medicine and health. This is a solid one, guys. Enjoy and check out our new podcast, Radical Health Radio. Wherever you listen to podcasts, you're going to find a lot of value there as well. And I think that, as I would say, Radical Health Radio will probably be a more digestible, less technical version of a podcast. Heart and Soil has come up with a lot of great topics and a lot of great guests. And I know my podcast can get kind of technical sometimes. Radical Health Radio is going to be very approachable for all of you. So enjoy. See you there. Morning. Welcome back to Radical Health Radio, friends. We have a juicy one for you today. We've got the man, the myth, the legend, Paul Saladino on the podcast. And we really get to find out a little bit more about who Paul is today. We dig beneath the surface a little bit. We learn about Paul's story, some of Paul's challenges, whether we could have even envisioned being where he is today, spreading the animal-based message. We learn about some surprising hobbies and habits that you might not know about Paul, and even some of his sexy time behaviors. We then move into a live call, a Q&A portion, where Paul and I interact with callers into Radical Health Radio. We encounter PCOS, headaches, stress management, autoimmune diseases, and a lot of other fun topics along the way. But the bulk of our conversation was really centered around the Radical Health Radio seven steps to radical health. I got Paul's insights on what those steps look like and how he would interpret them, and contrasting this through his experience of being a classically trained conventional medicine doctor how some of the limits of that shuts down critical thinking and limits us to what we believe is possible for our health and our empowerment on our health journey, and why we need to draw on ancestral wisdom to somewhat become our own doctors and to learn to authenticate our knowledge and turn that into wisdom through experience. It's a very fun conversation. We get to see parts of Paul that maybe we haven't seen before, and there's lots of juicy information to unpack. So let's dive in. Welcome back, friends, to another episode of Radical Health Radio. My name is Steve, and I have a very special guest today, Mr. Paul Saladino, the carnivore MD himself. Paul, how are you doing, my friend? It's great to have you on the show. Uh, I'm stoked, man. I'm really glad to be here, and everything is good. Yeah, good. I want to kick this off with a question of what does radical health mean to you? What's Paul's encapsulation of a true holistic view of what it means to be radically healthy? You know, I'm a child of the 80s. So when we were building Heart and Soil, I think even in my in my social media before that, I, I love this word radical. It's one of my favorite words. And it has all sorts of roots. I mean, the etymology, the word radical is interesting at the root, the radix. But I think that for me, it's just, it's, it's just living fully. Um, there's this kind of cliched expression that people talk about these days that, you know, we don't have a healthcare system. We have a disease management system mm. and health is not just the absence of disease. Mm. So I think that I agree with that. Health is not the absence of disease. Radical health is the adjective that I've put on the word health to give people the idea that like your life should be vibrant. Um, your life should be vital. Your life should be colorful in, in a metaphorical sense. And it should be, um, you know, really remarkable in, in all the ways. And a lot of our lives are not like that all the time. We all suffer with things from time to time, but I believe that, and I like the word birthright, mm. 
that that is all of our birthrights, that all of us are homo sapiens, and that I believe the homo sapien organism has an incredible potential that is not realized very often in today's world because we don't give enough attention to the conditions that are necessary to uh, bring forth that incredible potential that we have. So I think radical health is just a full expression of the potential of all of us in our daily lives, in our family lives, in our work lives, in our, our romantic lives, in our personal lives, in our you know, in our play lives, on the volleyball, wherever we want to be, like yeah. it's a full expression of the potential that we have as humans. Yeah. I love this holistic view of it being a real full expression of that. And that's kind of why we've devised these seven steps that we're going to dive into today. But to kind of touch on some of the stuff you just said there, that, you know, this health really is wealth. And how can we be rich in the currency of not just money, but rich in the currency of happiness and health and vitality and doing things that we love and things that put us in flow states? And what are our relationships like? And I just love hearing that from you. Obviously, a lot of background in the nutritional space, but also not not just losing the fact that it's worth it's so much more than that, too, you know, and the nutritional aspects and our physical health allows us to experience more of life and experience as our greatest teacher. And life is really fun when you can live it from that place. So I'm curious, Paul, you know, you've been on quite the journey. You've kind of come from relative obscurity in the last few years to being a very well-known name in this space. I'm curious if you ever envisioned that it would look like this for you. Was this ever part of the dream? Was it ever part of the vision to have a million followers on Instagram and be on TV shows and hosting podcasts? Like, what was the story there? No, man, it was not, it's completely unexpected, but uh, I'm really grateful to get to do it because... I get to do something that is really fun. It's fun to connect the dots and do creative work and feel like it's quite meaningful. And, you know, you guys see it at Heart and Soil and I see it in my comments on Instagram and YouTube. What we do changes lives. And that's, that's, that's amazing. That, that's really cool. But it was never expected. I, I, you know, when I got out of college, I was a ski bum. So mm. my, my original vision was, I'm going to travel around the world and the United States and ski and mountain bike. And I'm just going to live. And I threw hiked the Pacific Crest Trail and spent a lot of time in the wilderness. And, and then eventually I kind of had the itch that, that grew somewhere. And I, I kind of like biochemistry. I kind of like medicine. I think I'll go back to PA school. So I became a physician assistant, but immediately didn't like it because mm. I wasn't able to think for myself. I was mostly just doing things that other doctors told me to do. And that's, a, that's an important role that physician assistants and nurse practitioners have. And I think that as I grow, as I grew in my physician assistant career, I had more autonomy, but still I wasn't able to really profoundly affect the paradigm in, in the way that I suddenly realized I wanted to. So then I went back to medical school and then I went to residency. And during medical school and residency, I had some sense that I was not quite like my peers. Mm. And I don't know if that was because I was older or I had more experiences or I had fallen down mountains and flooded rivers and been caught in avalanches or what it was in my past that shaped my slight iconoclasm or my tendency toward being iconoclastic. I just, I don't know. I, I liked to see things differently and I like to connect the dots and I like to really drill down and, and, and ask what was at the root of things and, and the paradigms that I was presented with in medical school and residency were just not that interesting. So I, yeah. I kind of knew that I was probably not going to do things a traditional way, which got me in trouble a few times. But um, I think organically, it just ended up being a part of my journey that I was becoming more and more interested in nutrition and more and more interested in the way I was eating and how that affected my personal health. Many people will know that I had eczema and asthma atopic conditions throughout medical school and residency and even before that. And so I was just increasingly fascinated by why the heck these were happening and what was causing it. And I started iterating on my food and that was the beginning of really my journey. Uh, many, many years ago, the first iteration was vegan and then paleo and then paleo for probably almost a decade and then carnivore and then now animal-based. So it's it's been an interesting thing and it's, I think I'll just emphasize again, completely unexpected, but mm super exciting that people are finding value in it, which is the best thing that I can say um, is happening with, with, the amount of, uh, with the amount of reach that it's, that it's gained. Yeah, it's really incredible to see. And I think you, you said something that's really important though, which is going all the way back to the ski bum years of the experience of sliding down mountains and living life out in nature and going down the rivers and 
whitewater rafting all the way through the medical school of asking questions that kind of get you in trouble, you, you learned a lot, you experienced a lot. And I know you take a very similar ancestral view of life and this wisdom. And I think what that means is you've got a lot of wisdom. You've, you've learned a few things going through all of these different phases of dieting and phases of life and asking questions that quite frankly, get you in trouble is probably a good sign in today's culture that you're asking those kinds of questions. So I think in a, in a sense, it's, it's like the hero's journey, right? You become a little bit of a wise elder to other people. And now you're in this position as a radical health hero for them. They look up to you because you've lived it. You're obviously very intelligent and great at communicating ideas. But you're a walking, talking, living embodiment of being open, non-dogmatic, updating your views, and living life to the fullest. So with that said, I'm curious, you know, going through this more classical, traditional Western medical system and then coming, you know, breaking away from that and empowering people with this food is medicine paradigm. We're big here at Radical Health Radio of connecting stories and the stories of our listeners, the stories of the guests we bring on the show. Uh, and I'm curious, who maybe was your radical health hero when you was coming up? Did you have a radical health hero? Did anybody stand out that really changed your way of thinking? And maybe maybe updated that over the time if you went down the vegan path and then came back to the animal-based path. But I'm always curious, now you're in this position. You're sitting there as a hero to so many. Who was a hero for Paul? Good question. I haven't been asked this, so I'll have to think on my feet. Uh, yeah, certainly during the vegan days, there were vegan pundits that I that I thought were interesting. And, and as I've encouraged my listeners to do, I, I think we should all question the, the people that we look up to. I, I never want anyone to take what I say as canon. Mm -hmm. um, I, if anything, I just want to be a little bit of a, of a impetus for curiosity for people to ask themselves what they think about things. And I, I have to push back a little bit. I, I, I don't consider myself old, so I can't be an elder. And I don't really know that I'm wise. So I'm not a, I don't think of myself as a wise elder, but if people find value in what I do, that's awesome. Uh, and I think that the idea of a wise elder, it doesn't, maybe it doesn't mean this, but I think of somebody that's almost arrived at, at a point where they, the end of their journey. And I don't see that at all. I mean, if anyone follows any of my content on YouTube or my podcast or social media, they you know that I'm always evolving. And so I'm on this journey like everyone else. If anything, I'm just an enthusiastic participant mm. in this search um, rather than trying to be a leader in it. And, and if people find value in what I'm saying, that's awesome. But I don't think of myself in, in that way. Um, but it, I, I actually, I don't think I had specific examples of people in the health space. And, and that's probably reasonable because Honestly, there are not many people in the health space that really challenge dogma. And mm. historically, perhaps there were Linus Pauling, maybe Albert St. Georgi, um, a few others, perhaps you know, Nikola Tesla, not in the health space. But I think there were thinkers throughout time that did that. And I experienced people in my life who probably challenged me to think outside the box. And those people were probably more of my heroes, or I saw people mm in the world who were doing amazing things. And those people were probably more of my heroes. At different times, I think those heroes were different because for a while there, I was really into running. I don't do as much ultra, I don't do any ultra running now, but when, you know, when I was into ultra running, I, I really was, uh, I looked up to people who were super successful in that discipline. And now, now that I'm a surfer, I find very beautiful, powerful surfing to be um, enviable. So mm. I think there's a lot of ways that people can inspire us and, but it all, I think it all kind of goes back to creativity and thinking for yourself. And then the other theme that I would say from these people that I've seen is relentless, relentless curiosity and pursuit in the face of trials, in okay. the face of hardships, right? That, that no one gets to be in a place where they are successful, quote unquote, very few people get there easily, right? Yeah. And I think that we need the struggle along the way. So if, if anything, the people that I looked up to along the way were people who reminded me that when it was hard, I should keep pushing and mm. keep asking questions and keep researching and keep thinking about how to connect the dots. And, and the, the aspiration has always been beauty um, and elegance in surfing, in, um, in the way I communicate with people, in the way that I create content, in the way that I share ideas. So that's, that's the ethos throughout all of it. I don't know if that really answered your question, but it I did, man. Try. It was, it was a beautiful attempt. And, and I would push back on your pushback and say that, yeah, you're definitely not old and you're very vibrant and youthful and you can surf for three hours a day, but wisdom isn't necessarily confined to an age. Right. And I think the goal of our culture right now is maybe to try and awaken the wise elder in youthful people 
through experience. Like you just said something that's so powerful about going through challenging stuff, being able to push and double down when you meet adversity. And that's wisdom, you know? And I think another definition is, is really cool that wisdom is knowing the long-term consequences of your actions. And if you get too confined to dogmatic thinking, you'll not be able to see the red flags along the way. And something that is very relevant in your story and something I want to kind of, you know, branch into now is this ability to anticipate, understand the long-term consequences of actions and update your viewpoints on certain things. It's very common in, um, you know, dogmatic kind of borderline religious beliefs around diet that we get stuck and we're unable to kind of see things outside of our belief system. But you've kind of gone the whole gamut here and arrived at this more holistic view for now of an animal-based diet. I'm curious as to your interpretation of being open and able to change your mind when confronted with new evidence, despite potential pushback from an audience that's followed you and tried to maybe capture you. You know, there's audience capture in these spaces that you're a carnivore, Paul, and now what are you doing with all this fruit and honey stuff? How has it been to change your mind, grow as an audience, and also with that, obviously receive some criticism? I think the criticism is always good. Um, it helps us grow and it helps us think about our views. I think that there are people in the space who want a solid foundation upon which to base their nutritional and lifestyle choices. And that's understandable. Yeah. But more than anything, what I fear is stagnation. And that's just built into me as a human. So I think this is just who I am. I will always be this way. I will always be someone that that is evolving and changing. And it's interesting looking back to think about the things that haven't changed and the things that have. And mm. that's really insightful, I think. And I'll just talk about it briefly. Most of the listeners will know that I still believe animal foods are the most nutritious foods for humans. So that is something I feel pretty confident about at this point. You know, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of, not a lot, but I've seen a few things on the periphery kind of change and shift. And then organs are at the center of that appreciation also. And I continue to appreciate how valuable organs are for humans. And, and that is something that I grow in my, um, in my certainty regarding uh, almost on a daily basis. I hear, you know, people talking about it all the time. I see people in the space, uh, talking about the benefits of organs. And unfortunately I see people in the space who, who are not eating organs and perhaps eating just meat to develop nutritional deficiencies or feel better when they eat organs. And we know that historically, and we mentioned a little bit of this ancestral health perspective, but historically, there's no question that hunter gatherers eat organs. I've mm -hmm. seen it in person with the Hadza and almost every single anthropology book suggests that. Now, what has changed has been my perspective on carbohydrates. I think that within the original carnivore movement, um, there was this perception that carbohydrates were not good for humans. And that was an interesting thing to, to evaluate both personally and critically with the research. And that's something I've, I've sort of widen my gaze to, to incorporate in the last, I would say three to four years at this point. And for me personally, it's made a huge difference. And that, that has been encouraging. Now, your original question was, what is it like? Well, it's scary because mm. it's, it's really, it feels safer to, to say, no, this is what I stand for. And this is what I will do. But mm. I think at this point, I've also learned that people really appreciate authenticity and there's no, there's no substitute for trust. And so when people hear me say, I've evolved my perspective, which is just a fancy way of saying I changed my mind yeah. or I was wrong <laughs> about something, um, that it's, there's a lot of trust built because we all make mistakes as humans. Uh, we all know this from our childhoods or our adult lives as parents, as friends, as partners in relationships. And so I think that authenticity comes through when, especially a doctor or someone in a nutritional position says, hey, I changed my mind on this. And I've heard from some of my most trusted and respected friends that that was a huge thing for them. Um, that, I mean, people in my life who have achieved incredible amounts in their lives have said to me, when I heard you eating fruit, I thought, oh, that guy changed his mind. I can trust him more now. Yep. And that's, I think that's counterintuitive, but that's an important point for people to understand that there's no shame, I don't believe, in saying that you've continued to learn. Yep. I think there's, there's something regrettable about being so calcified, ossified, or, um, you know, basically fossilized in your beliefs that you continue to suffer or you don't admit that, Hey, there's, there's more to the picture than we thought. And I think that the fear on the backside for people is, is he just going to keep changing his mind about things? And, mm. and that's not really something that I think 
ends up happening. It's just a few nuances as we all kind of walk in this journey together toward radical health, toward a fullness of what we all really have um, as our birthright. So it's a fun process and it's a scary thing, but it's definitely been the right choice for me. And authenticity, honesty, um, building trust with people is something that I value above almost above anything. And, you know, trust is everything. And so yeah. I, I would, I would never want to do anything to break the trust with, with my audience. And uh, I think that that, that, that sort of evolution only engenders that. And I'll also say that increasingly in the comments, I see people say that they, they feel better when they add carbohydrates and they appreciate like, Hey, I appreciate the nudge. I was maybe a strict carnivore or a vegan or whatever. And, you know, the vegans, get the nudge to eat some organs or the vegans get the nudge to eat some meat and the strict carnivore might get the nudge to eat some fruit or some honey and not fear that stuff. And it's, it's encouraging to hear people say that they feel better with that because then I think, okay, those are, those are lies that, um, have changed positively. Better than probiotics for gut issues. Check out this review on gut and digestion from heart and soil supplements. This product is an absolute win. I'm so glad there's a palatable way to consume animal organs for optimal health. The pills are easy to swallow and have no aftertaste. Six months ago, I started taking gut and digestion from Heart and Soil Supplements because I had years of chronic gut issues. After beginning a paleo diet and taking probiotic supplements every day, much of the cramping and bloating subsided, but I still wasn't quite regular. Very quickly after beginning gut and digestion from Heart and Soil, I began having bowel movements every day. Sometimes I'll forget to take the supplements one day, and that usually coincides with missing a bowel movement but that's always fixed by just remembering to take the next dose. I've noticed my gut and digestive health seem to coincide more closely with regularly taking gut and digestion versus my probiotic supplement. I'm so grateful to Paul and Heart and Soil for formulating these amazing products. Gut and digestion and all of our supplements at Heart and Soil are entirely sourced from grass-fed, grass-finished cattle in New Zealand. And they're packaged in glass bottles because we hate plastic. These are the finest organ supplements on the planet Gut and digestion specifically contains stomach and tripe, the intestines, which are known to have unique peptides like BPC-157 in them, as well as other cofactors that are uniquely beneficial for gut health. If you have gut issues, check out Gut and Digestion. You can find us at heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to optimal radical health. Yeah, that was beautifully said, brother. And I think it it segues really well into a point I, I definitely wanted to touch on with you today and this ability to update and something you said, which is just continue learning, continue evolving. And I think you can speak to this better than anybody. I'm curious as your thoughts on the conventional modern m model of medicine versus, you know, evolving your thought processes after medicine school is done. You've been there, you've walked that path. And it seems that a lot of medical professionals get into the area for all of the right reasons, right? They care, they want to help, but they seem to be somewhat captured by the system itself. And maybe the learning stops. And you obviously have kind of tried to carry that torch forward and question these ideas. So why do, why should we question those ideas? Number one, and secondarily, why is more of this ancestral lens more appropriate to view the conundrum of modern health that we face? You're so right. Um, Western medicine is is staffed by people who are amazing humans. They want to help people. They're incredibly intelligent, but the system is built perhaps like so many of our education systems, dare I say, in a way that it rewards consistency and memorization. Mm. And I understand why. It's dangerous to have doctors and nurses just doing things in a cavalier way. Mm. So we have a system that moves very slowly. And, and sometimes we have a system that just won't move at all because of, I mean, interest, outside interests, you know, and we can speculate what those are, but I think most people can understand the sort of financial interests that might make uh, evolution within the medical sphere difficult and might make um, research in certain ways into nutrition difficult because most research is funded by, you know, pharmaceutical companies. So mm -hmm. why would we research the benefits of liver with an NIH grant when, you know, the, most of the grants are, uh, the NIH grants are few and far between. And then the majority, 75 plus percent of research funding is from, from private interests. And, and nobody has been able to um, get an FDA uh, approval or a, and I don't think we'd want that, or, you know, a patent on liver. We would never want that sort of intellectual property uh, taken from us as humans. But 
so medicine is tough because it, it's not mm. built to evolve. It's built to be sort of safe, <laughs> it, um, but also very, um, very difficult to change. Now, when you step outside of that, which is the unique position that I kind of find myself in with a traditional medical training, medical school, residency, board certification, totally traditionally trained, I think that there's a nice position where I can see the both worlds, right? I can start to think about medicine and look look at medicine from the outside. I don't practice medicine anymore. I don't see patients, but I can look back at what I've done and remember seeing patients. Remember, I know what mainstream medicine does and it's easy easier from this position to say, maybe we should think about changing this or that or, or mm. updating this. And then it becomes very clear. Uh, it's easier from sort of outside medicine, like just to the side to see what needs to evolve and change than it is from within medicine. Because the way the system is built, most doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners and physician assistants are just working so much, they can't even really think about mm -hmm. um, how they could potentially change the, um, the way they treat patients. But I will say that I think that one of the key things that we could do with medicine to change it is just to think more about nutritional science and medicine. That's just not taught. So I will say this, and I don't think it's conspiratorial. There's no, there's no real genuine attempt to teach nutrition in medical school. Mm -hmm. And I think any attempt would be better than nothing. I fear that most medical systems would teach nutrition in a way that I might not agree with, that might be overly focused on epidemiology, observational studies, which we know are confounded by healthy user bias and unhealthy user bias. But, but any attempt to teach nutrition would, I think, raise the right discussions. And hopefully the work that I've and many others have done would allow medical students to have resources to, to question their professors and attendings and supervising physicians regarding the nutritional findings that they have. But I think this is where the ancestral lens is so valuable. And again, I think this is the framework that Western medicine lacks that leaves us within Western medicine myopic. It leaves us blind in so many ways. It's kind of like, I don't know, people, many people might not have surfed, but people can just practice it now. If you just close one of your eyes, you have no depth perception. It's much harder to kick a soccer ball when you have one eye closed. It's much harder to catch a wave when you have one eye closed. And so that's the way I feel we are in medicine. We're, we're doing things with one eye closed. We may still be able to see what's written on a wall, but we have no depth perception. We have no framework. And so the ancestral lens, I think, adds that framework back. And mm -hmm. we think, what, what have humans done? And we'll never have a perfect picture of this. I wish we had the DeLorean. I wish you know, we had 1.21 gigawatts. And I wish we could go back in time and, and see it. We have some indication with the Hadza and other hunter-gatherers of what humans do and what we prefer. But there's only a few thousand of them left on the planet, which is why I felt like it was so important to go visit them. But I think that there, there's enough anthropology, there's enough we know from hunter-gatherers that we can use this ancestral lens and say, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense? And I wish that were added to medicine because I was never taught anthropology in medical school, but I really think it should be taught. I think anthropology and nutrition should be taught in medical school because that's the framework. That's where humans have come from. And mm. even today, in present day, in 2023, there are people living on the earth with significantly lower rates. And I'm talking, you know, in like massively lower rates of diabetes, chronic disease, obesity, cancer, autoimmune disease, depression, every single disease under the sun, there are people doing it. There is a natural experiment happening thousands of times over every single day. And Western medicine just turns a blind eye to that. I don't understand. There are people living. And of course, this is all observational research, but we, you know, Western medicine loves observational research, but we ignore the fact that there are people living all over the world who are doing things differently. And this can be extended to animals too. And I, I've always loved thinking about pets and how healthy animals are in the wild versus how healthy they are or unhealthy they are in domestication. And the reason I draw the parallels because I think that we are domesticated humans. I've mm. talked about this. We live in a human zoo and there are ways to step outside the cage doors. The cage doors are open. You could just, there are ways to do this, but it, it means bringing the ideas of how we've lived in the past into our quote, modern lives. And that's, that's a really cool idea for me. And that's how we live, right? Sunlight, exposure, uh, grounding, being in nature. These right angles are called, you know, landscapes of despair by Michael Easter and others. We need fractals and green and colors and human connection outside of the digital world. And we're just now beginning to understand, I think, how damaging a digital world can be for yeah. us. Obviously, people are listening to this in a digital, in a digital uh, platform, but the flicker on our screens, non-native EMF, is it a problem? Is it not? We don't fully understand toxins in our environment that are a result of our 
technologically advanced you know, world. So all of these things, and then centrally our food, how our food has changed. And when we look at that, I think it's very clear um, that, and it's so interesting to talk to people on my podcast and have this come up over and over. It's just like the simplest version is meat, organs, and fruit. I think every hunter-gatherer on the planet seeks those foods preferentially. If you look at these ancestral people, it's so clear what their hierarchy of desire is in terms of food, meat, organs, and fruit, and probably organs before the meat, and sometimes fruit even before the meat or honey, but they want all of these things, and they just really don't care much about vegetables, and they don't really do much seeds unless they're absolutely starving, and yet the majority of our diet, and if you look at the USDA guidelines, they say eat six to eight servings of grains a day. It's, boy, that's, that's not very ancestrally consistent, mm. and you know, seed oils is something that we've all, that I've talked about a lot. And that amount of linoleic acid is completely evolutionarily inconsistent when we're looking at what our ancestors do. And I wish that Western medicine would start to think about that and look at these natural experiments happening and question, not accept any of this as, as truth, but begin to question and incorporate it into the discussions. And I think that would really get people curious. It would shake things up, yeah, which would be a good thing. But um, hopefully there are still, and I, I believe there are, many people left in medicine who are willing to, to go through that little bit of uncomfortable sensation as they, as they learn, because growth, growth is uncomfortable for yeah. us. So that's the challenge. Yeah, that was wonderful, Paul. And, and there's a lot there, but there's a few like reoccurring standout themes, you know, the analogy of uncovering one eye and maybe rewilding ourselves a little bit more again to look for the animal that we are, right? And I think it was Carl Jung that said too much domestication of the animal will make it sick. And it's what you were saying, you know, you go look at animals in zoos, they're not necessarily thriving. You know, you can see there's a lackluster fire in their eyes has gone away. And that's kind of what we're becoming as a species. And maybe the answer is decentralizing medicine in a way of, of not trying to say that we're all medical doctors by any means. But if you track the root of the word doctor, it comes from the Greek doctora, which is to teach. And maybe we need more of these conversations, right? Maybe we need to empower people with the idea that food can be medicine and lifestyle can be medicine. And we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater and saying that, you know, medicine is all broken and unsalvageable because that's not true. You just said there are great minds and, and things hopefully get updated but also this complete dependence on that system is probably not going to continue to serve us, which is why we're having this conversation, which is why Radical Health Radio has our framework to empower people. And that's kind of what I want to move into now. We have this seven-step framework, and then we have some callers on the line that we're going to get in. So we're going to kind of take a, a kind of broad view of some of the seven steps. I'll briefly intro to them to you and what they stand for uh, from our perspective, and then I'll let you take that wherever you want. So our first step, and you already alluded to this, is eating organs. We really want this kind of low-hanging fruit, easily accessible kind of entryway into getting something in the diet that could be called nature's multivitamin, right? Very nutrient-dense, very bioavailable. Tell us the story about organs. Ooh, I mean, organs are so many different pieces of your body are organs. I mean, muscle meat is an organ. Muscles are an organ. Your skin is an organ right? We have, the story of organs is the story of specialization. Different tissues in the body do different things, enzymatically, detoxification-wise. And so we are a collection of different, um, different tissues that have different functions. But in terms of the nutritional um, value of organs, I think that there's, there's a lot of unique nutrients and bioavailable peptides and cofactors in these and I think that when we consider the fact that organs includes muscle, we think, oh, we're, you, everyone's already eating organ meat. I mean, mm. unless they're a vegan or vegetarian, in which case I'm super glad they're listening to this podcast because I think it could be really helpful. But all omnivores already eat organ meat. They just don't realize that they're only eating one organ, which is the muscle. And like so many things in our lives, it's valuable to diversify. Mm. It's valuable to diversify financially. It's valuable to diversify in terms of the way we do everything in our lives, the way we protect our family, the way we protect our ideas, the way we protect our, our children. And it's valuable to diversify. You don't just want to have all of your eggs in one basket. And it doesn't make sense for us. And historically, we've never done this. So organs are diversification of the portfolio. And along with that, at a biochemical medical level, comes vastly improved nutritional status for humans in a way that is remarkable. I think that there's, that's just, that's, really true. It's, it's a remarkable way that humans change when we diversify these organs. We're not just eating the muscle meat organ, we're eating a liver to start or a heart or a heart and a liver, or maybe even a testicle or a spleen or a thymus or something. And back to the ancestral lens, 
We've always done this as humans. It's never wasted, both from a calorie survival perspective and then also probably from a vitality perspective because we know that hunter-gatherers, based on the anthropology literature, select certain organs for certain people for certain mm-hmm. things. Pregnant women, uh, prenatal women, men and women looking to conceive had certain organs or certain foods that they were they were really recommended to eat. And so there's there's some wisdom in our history about the unique nutrients in these things. And we we see that more and more at Heart and Soil. And I see that more and more in the work that I do when people include organs in their diet. So starting with organs is is not as foreign to many people as, as it might be because yeah. most of us grew up taking multivitamins. I had Flintstones as a kid. I think I had some gummy multivitamins as a kid. And I would just, I, I, I love that. I think about organs as multivitamins. And if you want to start with liver or you want to start with a formulation or you want to start with just a collection of fresh organs, that's that's definitely the way to do it. And that is, it's both insurance and diversification yeah. and the results will be palpable, which I think is good for humans in terms of changing behavior. Yeah, that's what we're focusing on, something that is really tangible quickly. And you can see, you know, that on the shelf behind me and on the shelf behind Paul, there's there's supplements for that because some people get weirded out about eating the organs, but it's not always the case that you don't have to go right to chowing down some raw liver. You know, there's convenient supplements from Heart and Soil and other great places. So please check those out. But kind of something that goes together in this perfect one-two combination is the addition of a nutrient superfood like organs and also the elimination of processed foods. So I know this is a big topic that conveys a lot, but can you give us your two minute synopsis of why it's so important to eliminate processed foods? Probably do it quicker than two minutes, but I think it's just the processed foods are the single greatest driver of illness in humans. That's the end of the story. If you drill down a little deeper, you start to realize there are common ingredients in processed food. And that specificity, I think, is valuable for humans in terms of making behavioral change. So what do we see in processed foods? Almost invariably, we see seed oils, corn, canola, sunflower, safflower, soybean, peanut, whatever, even grapeseed. Mm. Um, so that's a huge driver. And I've done other podcasts about why that is. What mm-hmm. else do we see in processed foods? We usually see high fructose corn syrup. And a lot of times, sugar gets labeled as a bad actor. but Technically speaking, humans are made of sugar. We have glucose, we have fructose, we make these molecules in our biology. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense that pure sugar would be super harmful for humans other than being empty calories and devoid of nutrients. But what's so interesting is that, and I recently have done a podcast on this, there's a difference between high fructose corn syrup and pure sugar. And I'm not advocating for someone eating pure sugar, but I do think that humans consuming fruit and honey and maple syrup, simple sugars, is quite valuable for us and should not be feared. But high fructose corn syrup is a type of sugar that starts with corn. Mm. So it's made out of corn. It's made into a syrup. That syrup is basically, uh, you know, starches, of, which are all glucose, amylose and amylopectin, that have to then be um, broken down by enzymes. And then some of those glucose molecules have to be isomerized into fructose. And throughout all of that process, we end up with some problematic things for humans, including the potential for mercury contamination. It's not quite clear how much of the chloralkali process is still happening with high fructose corn syrup, but at least as recently as 2009, there were significant amounts uh, on the microgram per gram level of, uh, mercury in high fructose corn syrup. But then we also have free, we have free saccharides, you have free glucose and free fructose. And if you look at studies in animals and uh, GCMS, which is gas chromatography mass spectrometry of high fructose corn syrup, it has four to five times more calories than an equivalent amount of sucrose, of table sugar. So what's going on there? Is it undigested starches? And then we have concerns about whether starches are causing inflammation in the gut by damaging it. So We start with a food which is almost entirely genetically modified today, which is likely problematic for humans in a variety of ways, an Mm. unfamiliar set of genetics, an unfamiliar set of uh, proteins and antigens from corn. And then we have to do all of these industrial processes to make it into high fructose corn syrup with the potential of contamination and good evidence that it is in many ways much more problematic than the molecule of sucrose, just from a research perspective. So that's a really common thing in processed foods. Mm. And then we also have things like refined grains, which carry with them also problems with starches and the fibers, especially probably the soluble, but perhaps other insoluble fibers that can damage the human gut. And we know that when you damage the human gut, you're going to get inflammation. And inflammation more specifically looks like things that are named endotoxin, aka lipopolysaccharide. And that is at the root of many chronic illnesses. So we have to ask questions, what is damaging the gut? Well, 
I don't think humans are really meant to eat grains. These are survival foods at best. And we have evidence from many other animal models, including ruminants, um, that when you feed these animals lots of grains, you get acidosis, you get lactic acidosis, you get a ruminal acidosis, you get inflammation and a toxin increasing in their guts. And so these are the main components of processed foods. Now, more and more processed foods have a fourth ingredient, which is problematic for humans, which is artificial sweeteners. And this is insidious because many of us are taught to... Um, believe that artificial sweeteners might be good for us because they don't have calories. Mm -hmm. But I've recently begun to dive down this on my quest to continue learning. And there's some really compelling and also frightening evidence that the consumption of artificial sweeteners, specifically things like saccharin, ACE-K, aspartame, and sucralose, specifically as a study I'm thinking of, consumed alongside carbohydrates is, is wreaking havoc on our neurometabolic processes, completely confusing the brain and the gut and leading to insulin resistance in both children, adolescents, and adults. So Eliminating processed foods gets rid of most of this, not all yeah. of it, because many of these ingredients sneak into things that we might not think of as being processed in our lives. But um, this is a, it's really not negotiable to eliminate processed food. Well said, well said. Um, the next one we want to focus on is, is step number three, which is really about building healthy habits. Um, because I, I think that people don't necessarily decide the futures, they decide the habits and the habits decide the futures. So we understand this idea that habits are incredibly important and they, you know, dictate our health or our lack of health. You know, how we do one thing is sometimes how we do all things. So for this step, I'm actually just going to ask you maybe some surprising habits, you know, one to two surprising habits that you think creates radical health for Dr. Paul. Like, what do you do that some healthy habits that may be surprising for our listeners? Yeah, I appreciate this question. Um, uh, I didn't know you were going to ask it. I, we don't have scripted any of this, but I think it's a great question. Um, I think that the most impactful habits I have right now are some of the most impactful habits have to do around circadian rhythms and sleep. Mm. So getting sunlight in the morning, um, grounding, and that's built into surfing. But perhaps more importantly or equally important um, is screen avoidance late at night yeah. and and a, a distinct bedtime, which sounds uh, geriatric, uh, and we're going back to the wise elder thing, I suppose here, I can't escape it. But uh, <laughs> I mean, we know that having a distinct bedtime, uh, a distinct time when you go to sleep and a distinct time when you wake up, having a consistent circadian rhythm really helps with sleep quality. And I find that if I vary that even by 20 or 30 minutes, which definitely is hard sometimes in our lives, my sleep quality suffers. And yeah. so the habits that I try to develop are not looking at my phone, especially in like low light settings, which yeah. appears to have a higher flicker rate, which can really, I wouldn't even expect it, but it seems to really affect the circadian rhythm in a negative way. Not looking at my phone at all, Huge. Uh, you know, at, at night, even on a low light setting because of the flicker uh, and then consistent bedtime, consistent rising time, and then early morning sunlight. I think those are some of my most impactful habits right now, but th those Love are challenging that. for people. Yeah, they are very much so. And I think uh, it's not that sexy, right? We always think about what can we do and how can we hustle more or like do more? And it's like, no, protect your light environment, you know, get outside in the morning, ground yourself, look at the sun, get to bed on time, which is wonderful. So we've talked about kind of adding in the most nutrient dense food on the planet. We've talked about eliminating the most objectionable foods on the planet. We've talked about building healthy habits. Step number four is, okay, you eliminate all of this stuff. What do you eat? Now you've already alluded to this, that you eat the diet that nature provides provides an abundance in the most bioavailable form. Give us the two minute summary on this idea that you said, I think eating meats and fruits and things that come from nature is the bulk of our ancestrally appropriate and health promoting diet. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think that animal foods make up the bulk of any optimal diet for humans. Um, and I don't mean to be too strict on that, but I just think that Animal foods are so nutrient rich and there's a lot of ways to do it. You can make animal foods, eggs, milk, dairy. I'm eating a lot of, or drinking a lot of raw milk these days, yeah. uh, raw cheeses, um, and then meat and organs. So that's the centerpiece of the diet. And then adding to that are the carbohydrates because you mm -hmm. can get fat and protein from the animal foods. You don't get many carbohydrates from the animal foods. So where do we get carbohydrates from? Most people, myself included, just do oatmeal or grains. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's the best source for humans for a lot of the reasons we mentioned earlier, anti-nutrients, phytic acid, oxalates. I just think that there are better ways to get carbohydrates from simple sugars. And we alluded to this. We don't have to go deep down this rabbit hole, yeah. but I don't think there's a reason to fear those. And I think there's good evidence to suggest they're helpful for humans. In fact, there are randomized controlled studies with diabetics giving them 
um, at the end of an eight week period, their, their amount of honey was increased every two weeks. And in the last, I think the final two weeks, they had hun- over a hundred grams of honey, perhaps even more. And, and their fasting glucose and fasting insulin went down and they lost weight. So, um, that's, that's a nuanced thing. Yeah. Um, and people should talk to their physician or consume some of the content that I've put out regarding sugars and, and how to use them in, in your, you know, sort of medical state. But I don't think that sugars or simple sugars are even harmful for people with diabetes, which is a radical, a radical notion. And so beyond that, I think getting the carbohydrates from things like fruit or fruit juice, preferably fruit juice that you've made, um, and, and honey and maple syrup is the best way that we do it as humans. And there's, I should emphasize that you need to be in control of the foods you're eating because yeah. the additives in these foods can be harmful for humans. Um, you know, citric acid is an additive to a lot of processed foods, even fruit juices sometimes. And that is derived from um, problematic sources or, you know, uh, can have mold contaminants. Even vitamin C added to fruit juices can be from bad sources like yeah. corn and can have triggering actions. So if you're thinking about a fruit juice, it, it should really just be sim- super simple fruit juice. I don't even fear that. I make a lot of orange juice fresh squeezed at my house. Now I have mangoes that I will juice, but getting fruit, getting honey, getting maple syrup. Beautiful. Now, overarching that is a little bit more nuance regarding the macros. And I think people should experiment with this and see where they feel best. But this is another thing where I've started to kind of evolve and experiment a little bit recently by increasing carbohydrates. One thing that stayed pretty consistent was the amount of protein. Mm -hmm. I find that for most of us, around a gram or a little less than a gram per pound of goal body weight seems to be a good place for protein. So if you start there, and then you can kind of vary fat and carbohydrates and see where you feel better, whether you feel better with a little more carbohydrates or a little more fat in your diet. But I do think both are necessary. When I cut down too much on fat, I don't feel good. When I cut down too much on carbohydrates, I don't feel good. So you know, people can follow my content or, you know, reach out to the health guides at Heart and Soil if they need a little more guidance on that last, the last piece of that macro equation. But, but I think that thinking about that and then filling those buckets with the foods that we mentioned is a pretty good starting point. In fact, let's just be, I'll be candid. You know, I think it's a freaking great starting point for most people. Yeah. I think it gets most people most of the way there. Right. And it's just consistently following the laws of nature and trusting that. And again, drawing on that ancestral wisdom and integrating into these modern high tech lives. So our next step is all about the physical, pushing yourself physically. Um, You have um, made it no um, secret that you're a surf obsessed dude. And these days you find yourself <laughs> on the water for a couple of hours each day. I want to know what your current relationship is to movement and, you know, kind of turning that up sometimes, slowing it down sometimes and how you push yourself physically. The, the thing I'll say from the outset is you can overdo this. Yes. Like anything, you can overdo this. And I don't think it's good to overdo it. I think exhaustive exercise is something that we should be careful of as humans. And look, I respect people who go hard in the paint, in the bat, you know, playing basketball metaphorically or physically, or, you know, I respect people who go hard in the gym, but I think that if you want to go hard in the paint, metaphorically, you need to make sure you are checking your labs and understanding things like a cortisol to testosterone ratio or a cortisol to DHES ratio, because you will easily get overtrained and you will do the opposite of what you want to do. You also need to understand your thyroid. So I think that movement is actually easier than most of us believe. This Mm -hmm. isn't, this isn't paying penance, uh, this isn't paying penance for, for sins of your past, you know, for all of the seed oils you've eaten, you don't need to kill yourself. (laughs) Um, go easy on yourself, do what you enjoy. If it's dancing, if it's walking, if it's ballet, if it's bar, if it's, uh, Zumba, if it's yoga, um, some movement, your body will tell you what it wants. And a lot of times your body tells you when it doesn't want it. The beautiful thing for me about surfing is it's just freaking fun. And I get out when I want to get out. And usually that ends up being about two hours every day. Sometimes it's closer to three, but often two to two and a half. And I don't push it. Um, and then that's about it for me right now. I don't even do much weightlifting anymore because I don't feel the need to. Occasionally I'll jump on the pull-up bar, but most of my stuff is mobility now. Yeah. I have weights in my house and maybe I'll do a little overhead press or a little, a few pull-ups, but most of the stuff I do now is body weight because surfing is what I want to do. And if I am in the gym accumulating a ton of extra muscle mass, that doesn't help my surfing. And I don't find that I'm actually losing much muscle mass. I think that something I'll say that people will find 
really striking, and perhaps people will, will want to debate, is that your body will gain muscle mass if you sleep, if you give it enough nutrients, if you give it enough carbohydrates, and your thyroid is appropriate. If yeah. you are not in an overly catabolic state, if your cortisol is not elevated for a variety of reasons, whether it's gut inflammation, endotoxin, toxins in your diet, overly stressful, not enough sleep, your body will hold on to and build muscle. And that's really cool. And I think that's that's what I experienced, that I don't have to really work too hard to maintain my current frame of muscle. And people can see that. Actually, I started wearing my shirt a lot more on Instagram. So people may not know <laughs> how muscular I am. I'm not overly muscular. I'm moderately muscular. Yeah. Um, but it's it's out there. I mean, if you search a picture of me shirtless, you won't have a hard time finding it. So yeah, and that's yeah I think don't over don't overdo it. Yeah, and because I, I think what I'm hearing you say is, well, you're you're optimizing for what brings you the most joy, which is another facet of the physical thing, which is play. We forget so much, right? We take life so seriously, but your surf is a combination of your exercise and your movement, and yeah, there's certainly sprint efforts in there when you're trying to catch a wave, right? But there's a lot of kind of yeah. meandering on top of the water, but it's very playful. It brings you joy, so you're optimizing for that. And I think that's a very important point we don't want to miss in this step is it's not always balls to the wall, go as hard as you can and wreck yourself. It's about you know what you want to be able to do, what brings you joy, and do you want to be able to do it for the long run? And maybe sometimes we go a little bit because of our paradigm of more is better. We break our bodies down, we get hypercortisolemic, and that can cause other upstream problems. So moving on to level six, we're almost there. I want to hear about your thoughts around what we call leveling up. And what we're talking about here is potentially just poking some of these hormetic stresses from time to time, a little dip in the cold plunge, a little exposure to heat in the sauna. We may be looking at things in our environment that maybe might be slipping under the rug for some people. So what are a couple of things in this kind of level up, right? If you think about the previous steps we've talked about, if people are doing that, like I said, they're 80% of the way there. What would you say are some things that maybe take people that last 10 to 20% me a couple of options that you think could be really useful there, whether it's hormetic stresses or being aware of toxins in the environment. Yeah, I would say more of the latter. I think that we, my sense is that humans tend to overdo it. Yeah. So when we're thinking sauna and cold, we're, most of us are overdoing it, myself included. You know, I could stay in the cold plunge longer than you, or I'm going to really hit myself hard on a sauna and you know, those are all going to raise stress hormones. I think that that's valuable in uh, medicinal doses, but be careful with that like anything else. I think that the the biggest lever that I would say is, is the toxin piece and just freaking sleep, people. Like, treat sleep like business. Treat sleep like, like, like a child. You know, like, take care of your sleep. And it's not sexy to say that. And, and you kind of said that earlier. And in some ways it's it's anti-sexy because maybe your partner wants to have a romantic evening and she wants to, or he wants to stay up late and, you know, and do sexy things late at night. But I mean, that's the thing that every, all of us can navigate in our own lives. Um, so you just do it's, sexy it's, things during the day is what you say, right? <laughs> Before 7.30, you okay, know? Okay, good. There you go. That's very, <laughs> that's sexy. I like it. <laughs> Uh, before 7 30 there's plenty of time in the day to do sexy things good, good. Uh, for me because i go to sleep so early because i get up so early uh yeah this is tmi for all of you but uh not a lot of sexy things happen after 7 30 <laughs> or 8 o'clock at night <laughs> maybe on special occasions or who it. knows but uh um i think that being aware of toxins is a way to level up and yeah. thinking about nuance around um water around environment non-native emfs around um, I mean, they're everywhere now. I just read an article the other day. There's BPA in paper towels and there's BPA in toilet paper. And I was telling uh, my team here in Costa Rica about that. And they were like, well, we're not going to stop using toilet paper. And I'm thinking like, maybe I'll stop using toilet paper. I have a bidet, so it's a little more doable for me, you know, <laughs> but uh, it's just, everybody can kind of do those things at the level at which they are able to, but being aware of those things, I think will help people in their lives. Um, toxins in the home, the products you used to clean, all these things are, are pretty critical. Um, yeah. That's great. And last but certainly not least, the reason we're building this seven-step framework and the reason we're trying to do all of this, which is you know get radically healthy and what that means, is to really achieve and activate our why. We're trying to turn this radical health into a radical self. We're trying to leave things better than we found it. We're trying to empower people with this. Okay, you now have all of this energy and all of this kind of life force to channel into something to really kind of leave the world better than you found it, build a family that you want to build, launch the business, or just take life to the next level. So obviously we started kind of at the beginning here with your story of how you've actualized your radical self and continue to do so. So we don't need to go too deep into this one, but I just maybe would like to throw it back to you. If you have one tip for people, like you said, around the growth being uncomfortable or consistently evolving your thought processes or, or why, 
this, this, the seven step framework and the way that you phrase health, like why it's so important to this piece of the puzzle to becoming a more integrated, holistically put together human and what that affords you in life. I think that every human questions what we're doing here and we all search for meaning. Yeah. And I think that we all feel more embodied as humans when we do good in the world and we all show up as our best selves. And so I think that part of what we all need or crave is to be the best version of ourselves so we can do the most good or just do the things we're most passionate about. And I think that's why we do this. You know, we, We're all searching for meaning. We all want meaning in our lives. We know that's critical for humans. That's, that's really indubitable that, that humans need meaning. Well, the best way to, um, to manifest your gift at the risk of sounding too ho hokey or woo, woo I'm not really like that. But I, I do think that we all have gifts and the best way to manifest your gift is to respect who you are and, and to enable yourself to do that. That's what we talked about. That's the radical health piece of this is, is manifesting your gift. There's a, there's a runner that I used to really idolize, Prefontaine. And, and he had this quote, which was attributed to him, which was to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice the gift. And I really like that because I think that at the end of our lives, this kind of memento mori concept, like we will all look back on our lives and how much did we give and how much were we able to give? Again, this isn't back to the overtraining perspective. I should have gone harder in the gym. This is how much were you able to give because you, you have to turn it off to turn it on. Um, and you have to, you have to relax to grow, you know, you have to, you know, find time to recover, to get better. So I think we all walk this line yeah. of wanting to be the best version of ourselves. And this is what I think it's all about being the best version of yourself so that you really, really get to manifest this gift while you're on the earth. And what, what could any of us ask for other than that in our lives? Yeah. Amen to that brother. I think you just said something that's really important. And, you know, sometimes I guess it, it veers into the woo woo territory, but let's bring it on right now, which is, you know, that there are no two humans on this planet that are alike from a cellular biological perspective. Everybody is very unique. And with that uniqueness comes a gift. And like you said, like there is nobody in the world that can do what Paul Saladino does better than Paul Saladino can do it because you are you, you're completely unique. The same as I am me and every listener is them, your, your completely unique self. And that means there's something that they do better than anybody else in the world can do it. And maybe just maybe this radical health framework is the key that can unlock that door. So with that said, I really appreciate your thoughts and your insights onto the framework. And we actually have some callers on the line that are going to jump in and pick your brain, Paul, and I'll uh, kind of like let you lead the dance here, but I'll introduce our callers onto the show. So uh, first up, we have Josh, who is from Texas, and he is calling in about Parasite. So Josh, are you on the line, brother? And how can we help you? Definitely, definitely. So uh, first off, man, I just want to say thank you guys so much for having me on. Uh, it's an honor just to, to speak with both of you guys. Uh, I've been following Paul for, for some time now, and uh, I am definitely geeking out a little bit. <laughs> so I appreciate it. Uh, the question I had was uh, parasites. Uh, I've been on the animal-based diet now for about two weeks. I, I've had a little issues with asthma and, and stuff like that, and I wanted to touch, touch uh, base on that, but uh, I was really curious about parasites. I've been noticing more people uh, kind of talk more and more about parasites in the body and thus causing cancers. I didn't know if, if you guys knew anything about cancers. And if so, what actions can one take to prevent or kill off these parasites in the body? That was the, the main question I had today. Thank you, Josh. You yeah, want to take great... that one away, Paul? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I see this more and more. The first thing I'll say is, if anyone is worried about parasites from raw organs, you can cook the organs or get them desiccated. These are really safe ways to do it. Um, you can also decrease the probability by freezing the organs. I think technically with liver, you have to deep freeze it for a long amount of time. But, you know, the parasite thing is interesting. My perspective now, which is always evolving, is that this is something that is being made a bigger deal than it really is. In, in my time working with clients, I very rarely saw parasites that were clinically impactful every once in a while. I think I saw one person with um, entamoeba um, and maybe one person with a worm, but it's really rare, especially if you live in the United States. And so I think that there, we too often in 
medicine, I think we end up chasing our tail. And even within like, quote, alternative medicine, I think we end up chasing our tail in ways that ends up being quite harmful for people. So I think that the first things I would say are the foundational things that we've talked about here. Do these things first and see if your GI symptoms improve. See mm -hmm. if your autoimmune things improve. See if your fatigue and libido things improve. And I think more often than not, they will. If you are doing everything right, everything right, and you're still having gut issues, maybe it's worth doing a test that's like a DNA test of your gut to see, of your poop, to see if there's actually a parasite in there. But until you do that, I don't think I would go too hard against the parasites because many of the formulations and treatments can be harmful and they contain herbs, which are not benign. They can be used as medicine, but they are not benign and they can cause a lot of issues for us as humans. So do other things first. I think parasites are very, very far down on the totem pole. If you've been to Africa, you know, if you're eating raw meat in Africa or drinking water in Africa, yeah, maybe there's something there. If you've been traveling, yeah, but the human body is actually pretty good at, at, at dealing with these things. And people are even using things like, uh, you know, roundworms on the skin to treat autoimmune disease. It's probable that we were colonized sometimes as humans throughout our evolution. So it's kind of a gross thought to think about it, but there are trillions and trillions of organisms in our guts. And to think that they're completely sterile is crazy. I think most of us don't have worms or amoebas in our guts. The body is pretty good at getting rid of those. But I think that there's an overemphasis and an overfocus on this. And I think that it's well, well served because people are not getting better with Western medicine. You know, mainstream Western medicine is not fixing people. So they're asking the right questions. Could it be parasites? I think it's very rarely the problem. And I think most people don't have this issue. And I'll just piggyback onto another one now, which is candida which I get asked about a lot. I think candida is misunderstood. Um, sugars didn't cause you to have candida. You know, if you have a GI imbalance, sometimes eating sugars may cause that to get a little worse, but they didn't cause it in the first place. And I think that you need to go back to thinking about what things in your diet are irritating the gut or are causing bacteria in the colon to become imbalanced. And so people can follow my podcast, Fundamental Health. I've talked about this. I have concerns that starches may do this for people. Soluble fiber, rather than insoluble fiber, may cause imbalances in the colon, may cause gram-negative overgrowth leading to endotoxin and LPS. And then when things get imbalanced in the gut, can you get um, a candidal overgrowth? Yes, but I think that the way most people are looking to solve their candidal overgrowth is not really fixing the root cause of the problem. That is, I don't think eliminating honey for the rest of your life is the cause, is the, is the way to treat your candida because that's just, that, that isn't what caused it in the first place. In the short term, maybe it helps, but you really need to look at why the gut is imbalanced. And oftentimes it comes back to just super simple concepts. What is the water you're drinking? What are the nutrients you're getting? Are you irritating your gut? Are you having things in your diet that are increasing endotoxin? Beans, grains, legumes, uh, all these things. Are you eating too many starches? Are you having corn syrup? Are you having unknown corn syrup? Are you having additives in your food? Carrageenan, pectin, other gums. Make it super simple and then go from there. I think that there's this well-intentioned but misguided uh, way of doing things that people put the cart before the horse way too yeah. often when it comes to GI stuff. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you, doctor. That was very succinct. And, and it, I think a reminder that I think you said in that question there, Josh, that you've only been doing this for a couple of weeks and you know, broad scale speaking, most people are gonna have unhealthy guts. They're a little inflamed, they're not so great. So stick to those basics, give yourself some time to settle in and trust the process. Like, like Paul said, if you're doing this and you're nailed and you're dialed in after a few months, you're not seeing improvements, consider a test. And we'll also hook you up with our health success team and get you a bottle of gut and digestion to really speed up that process and get you some good healing there. So thank you very much, Josh. And we're moving on to our next caller today, which is Kiana from Oregon. Kiana's got a question, a couple of questions here about PCOS. Kiana, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for having me on. You're welcome. What can we help you with today? Well, like you said, I do have PCOS and Paul did touch on it a little bit about um, insulin. Um, but I'm wondering because I have a really difficult time losing weight. I've been doing emerald days for a while. My hormones have been bad for a while. But I'm wondering, should I be limiting my sugar from fruit and honey when I'm on the animal based diet? So can I ask you a, a question? Do you take birth control? I just recently got off birth control. I've been off birth control for about a month. Okay. So PCOS, I think of as insulin resistance and excess cortisol. So insulin resistance in an overly simplified paradigm, which is pretty workable, is, is related to seed oils 
and cortisol. And cortisol is related to not sleeping enough, inflammation in the gut, and endotoxin. So if you work on those things, I think the PCOS will get better. There is this mainstream narrative that PCOS is in hyperandrogen, and I don't believe that. I think it's probably hyperestrogen, which is related to inflammation, which is kind of related to other things in the gut and overall in your body. So I think that the way to start would be thinking about your food, thinking about seed oils, thinking about your sleep, minimizing cortisol, minimizing stress, and thinking about the foods that could be causing GI inflammation and endotoxin and going from there. That would be my first um, suggestion. We've got, there's her package at, at Heart and Soil, which would probably be another great thing to try. I've definitely seen some um, testimonials that it helps with that kind of stuff too. But I think that giving your body time to adjust to a transition off of hormonal birth control will also be quite valuable. Um, I think that... Um, the excess estrogens, I don't know if you were on a progestin only or an estrogen progesterone or an estrogen based birth control, but the excess estrogens in birth control, I think is, is quite harmful for people and can cause a lot of problems. Um, is that helpful? Do you have any, um, what else can I tell you? Um, I did have one more question. Were you asking if I had another question or? But if, if that answers your question regarding PCOS, or if, if you need more details. Um, I would like to mention that I have been, I did get my blood work done pretty regularly and I have been able to get my cortisol down. So it's, I think it used to be 15 and now it's at 8.3. Um, but uh -huh. my, in, my um, insulin is just, it's really, I think a really hard time getting it down. And I, like I said, I have been doing animal based for a while and I feel great. Otherwise all my other markers are really good. It's just my insulin. So do you think I'm okay? Like still eating the, the honey and the fruit? Absolutely. Yeah. Those don't, those don't cause insulin resistance. Yeah. That was another question you had. Those don't cause insulin resistance. I think that limiting them will cause worse insulin resistance and you may not actually be eating enough carbohydrates. The other place I would look is your thyroid. So make sure you get a full thyroid panel, TSH, free T3, free T4, reverse T3, and maybe even anti TPO and anti thyroglobulin antibodies because the thyroid is going to be connected here also. So think about your thyroid um, but definitely you don't want to limit your carbohydrates. If anything, I would eat more carbohydrates to really give the thyroid the fuel that it needs to work. Because if you limit the carbohydrates, your thyroid will get out of whack and that will just create more insulin resistance. We know that your cortisol will go up. There's good evidence that on ketogenic diets with less than 4% carbohydrates, um, the body does make more cortisol. The enzymes in the liver, 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type one goes up, which makes more cortisol. So limiting carbohydrates is probably the problem rather than the solution. So in fact, for you, I would say, try eating more carbohydrates and keep an eye on the thyroid. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I did have one more question about my vitamin D. Yeah. Um, when I first got my blood work done way back in 2020, I was super low in vitamin D, B12 and iron. So they put me on supplements. And this is before animal base. And of course, I was able to get them back up. But um, after I had my second baby, I decided I wanted to just switch over to liver pills. And so my, my iron and vitamin, and my iron and B12 is very good, but my B, but my vitamin D is still really low. So I'm wondering, is there a way that I can make it go up other than some exposure? Um, are you taking supplements, vitamin D3, like a cholecalciferol? No, I stopped taking it. I was hoping that just taking the liver pills would be enough. <laughs> so liver. It, liver is amazing, but the amount of vitamin D as liver is not enough for somebody that's super deficient. I think that historically in the summers, no matter where you are, we would have just soaked it up and we would have had enough in our fat stores for the winter. But so many of us, even in the summer are working indoors and we're not just outside all summer. So I think that to get back to a good level, just take a vitamin D supplement. So, um, I think we're not, I can't ever give medical advice, but if I were in the situation or somebody in my family, the situation, I would think about something like two to 5,000 IUs of vitamin D3 a day, um, depending on where your vitamin D3 levels are right now. And again, that's connected with thyroid and inflammation overall, but definitely I think that the best you can do at this moment is, is get a vitamin D supplement. So cholecalciferol, vitamin D3, look for something in olive oil, um, look for something organic and it should be pretty good. They also make small vitamin D lamps, um, that are used in these Norwegian countries. They're kind of like mini tanning beds that some people use, um, for vitamin D as well. We actually had one. I remember I had one in Austin. There should be one floating around hard and soil somewhere. Who knows? <laughs>
Thank you so much, Doctor. And thank you, Kiana. The only thing I'd potentially add there as well is, A, um, in Oregon, I know that in the winter months, it can get pretty gloomy. So maybe a full permission slip to get yourself a nice holiday out to Austin or Florida and go get some sunshine. And really, as well as we think about all of the nutritional um, things that uh, Paul gave you to chew on there is also just mitigating stress through our step number three as well, these healthy habits, you know, Try to get outside more. Try to take a little daily walk. Try to manage your stress through things like a mindfulness practice or journaling. It's incredibly healing to the body, especially if we've got some issues, you know, detoxing from birth control, thyroid is slowing down. If the body's stressed, yes, nutritional components are very critical, but also the psychological and somatic experience too. So think about those habits as well, Keanu, and combine those two. And I think you've got a winning formula. Thanks for calling today. Okay, next up, we have Mr. Jim from Arizona, who has a little question here about his triglycerides and his animal-based journey. Jim, are you on the line, and what can we help you with, my friend? I am, yes. Thank you. I appreciate you taking my call. I'm uh, 64 years old, and I've been on a carnivore diet for about two and a half, three years. My question is, recently I had some blood work done and was surprised that my triglyceride level was 91. I've been increasing my carbohydrates lately by eating some bananas and blueberries. Prior to that, I was eating very few carbs. Um, and usually that's been in a protein shake. And I'm wondering if the artificial sweeteners in the protein shake could have increased my carbohydrate or my uh, 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 carbohydrate level uh, but to, to, to that amount. The triglycerides, are you wondering whether the artificial sweeteners could have increased the triglycerides? It's certainly possible. Which artificial sweetener is in your protein shake? You got to throw that out, my brother. <laughs> got to get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, I did. Actually, based on your, on your video, um, I did throw that out. I didn't realize yeah, that yeah. was a bad thing. 91 is not horrible for triglycerides. Again, I'm going to um, challenge you to check your thyroid and probably recommend um, that you eat more carbohydrates. And see how you do. Uh, I think right. that coming from carnivore, a lot of us, myself included, this was my journey too, are a little hesitant. But over time, I found that the more carbohydrates I eat, I, I, I do better. Again, I'm exercising about two hours a day. You may not need 200 grams, but I, I would I would suspect, I mean, do you have any sense of how many carbohydrates you're getting a day? If you're doing bananas and, and other fruit, I, I bet that you're under 100, but I could be wrong. Do you have a sense of that? Yeah. I do think it's been been under a hundred. Usually it's just carbo usually it's just uh blueberries and bananas so far. So and that's just kind of being introduced the last few months. Yeah, it's a good start. But I get a lot um, of exercise. I would, you know, I've been a what's lot that? Of, maybe a lot of exercise with this place in jujitsu. So Oh yeah. I would I would recommend increasing the carbs. Um don't fear it. Uh you could try honey, maple syrup, um, other fruit, fruit juice. Uh, and I would think, go to, go to 150, go to 175, see how you feel. I wouldn't fear it. Um, I think that the more carbohydrates you give your body, and obviously there's a limit, you don't need to give your body 500 grams, but I think that if you give your body 150, 175, even 200 grams of carbohydrates, that's going to really improve your thyroid function. And I bet the lipids will improve and then getting rid of the artificial sweeteners. I think the triglycerides will, will almost certainly come down. And I bet your LDL will come down too. Again, I don't worry about LDL as a real marker of um, cardiovascular disease, I, I see it more as a marker of thyroid function these days. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, keep us posted. Perfect. Keep Thank us posted. And uh, yeah, keep us posted and go eat, go eat three tablespoons of honey right now. Yes, Jim. And I can speak from experience <laughs> with the jujitsu thing. It's it, it it's pretty intense. You know, it's very in that yeah. glycolytic pathway for sustained periods. If you're doing that numerous times a week, I know it can be a little scary, like Paul said at first, to start titrating that carb number up. But I'd be willing to bet that not only are you going to feel better, but your performance and recovery from jujitsu is going to improve as well, man. So keep the experiment going. Go for those easily digestible nature's offering sources of carbohydrates and keep us posted and let us know how you go. Good luck, my friend. Okay, next on the line, we have Ben from Ohio, who has a question around autoimmune issues. So Ben, are you on the line with us right now? And how can we help you, my friend? Yes, sir, I am. Thanks for taking my call. Hey, I've got a couple things. Um, one, in 2019, I was diagnosed with alopecia, uh, mainly on my head and face and chest. Um, I've gone from a vegan diet to paleo diet, and I'm kind of like stuck in between to try to figure out um, how to uh, reverse some of this stuff 
um, because if you look online or you talk to a doctor, they want to prescribe meds and I'm kind of against that kind of stuff. So one, what is your opinion on things that I can do to reverse that? Yeah, absolutely. So this is an autoimmune type, excuse me, an autoimmune type of alopecia. It sounds like rather than a, a male pattern baldness, if you're losing hair on your face or your skin, as well as your head. And I think that's very responsive to diet. And I think this is where something like an intentional animal-based diet shines. This is, this is the best case application for this way of eating. So if I heard you right, you said you're stuck between kind of vegan and paleo. Um, you know, I would say try animal-based. And what that means is cut out the vegetables. So that's leaves and stems and roots and seeds. Um, and then even think about nightshades a little bit, things like tomato or goji berries, eggplants. And then focus on the foods that we've talked about and focus on eliminating things like artificial sweeteners or food additives that could also be irritating the gut. Because I think that my high level view of what's happening here is that something is irritating your gut. Multiple things are irritating your gut, whether it's carrageenan, pectin, gums in the foods you're eating, things in vegetables, starches, soluble fiber, who knows what, and that's triggering an immune response. And then once that's triggering an immune response because of these damage to the gut, there's like this kind of uh, this this vicious cycle. And so just simplifying, I agree with you. Uh, I think immune modifying medications are uh, the last resort in this case. And we know they have um, some pretty serious side effects. So start with just simplifying the diet. There's a version of paleo called AIP, autoimmune paleo, which starts to move in this direction. It gets rid of things like nuts and seeds on a paleo diet. It gets rid of nightshades. So it's like halfway between paleo and animal-based. But I think even better would be cutting out all the vegetables. So if you're eating any root vegetables, if you're eating any leaves, if you're eating any stems, any seeds, which is seeds, nuts, grains, and beans, I would try eliminating those and then focusing on the foods that we're talking about. And the simplest version is just meat, organs, and fruit. And then go from there. You don't have to overcomplicate it. The health guides at Heart and Soil can help you with this. And I've done a lot of content there. But that's where I would start for this. And there definitely are anecdotes. Admittedly, there are anecdotes. But there are some pretty impressive anecdotes of people who do these kind of intentional elimination diets. Some people do strict carnivore. um, But again, I think that long term, that's probably going to be harsh on the body from a cortisol perspective and a thyroid perspective. And I think you, you don't really lose anything by... Um, including easily digestible sources of carbohydrates from the beginning. Does that make sense? Is that helpful? Yeah, absolutely. And then one other question, this is kind of maybe a long drawn out answer for you guys. Um, Why is there so little information on autoimmune uh, diseases in general? Like, like if you ask a doctor, I'm like, well, we don't know what's causing it. We have no idea why, what's your body doing? Um, Because my wife has Sjogren's, which is, a nerve uh, autoimmune disease, and they can't sure. give her any answers either. So my semi-conspiratorial answer is that pharma funds all the research, man. <laughs> you know, and right. there are so many. Western medicine loves to categorize things. We love to make diagnoses. It makes us feel really important. I looked it up one time when I was doing some content for social media. We have over 10,000 diagnoses in Western medicine. That makes us feel really smart. We're like the shamans of the new age. We have all these complicated esoteric voodoo mechanisms and these complicated words that we use and all these crazy diagnoses. And it doesn't serve patients because I think that it's all the same thing. It's just how we all manifest it. I mean, that's an oversimplification, but I would say that my paradigm is that psychiatric illness is neuroinflammation, autoimmune disease is gut inflammation, manifests differently in every human. In me, it's asthma and eczema. In you, it's alopecia. In your wife, it's Sjogren's. In someone else, it's going to be autoimmune thyroiditis, also known as Hashimoto's. But it all starts in the same ways. So if Western medicine admitted, oh, it's all the same thing, it all starts in your gut, well... <laughs> They're either only going to have one medication to sell you, which is a medication like, I think it's called the Rosatide. I think it's just, medi- it's just a uh, Lazarotide or something. It's just an experimental medication that actually helps tighten the gap junctions in your gut, but I'm sure has other side effects. Or they're just, they're actually going to have to look at nutritional research. And so I think the challenge is, is multiple fold. But I think the problem is that there's so many different autoimmune diseases and Western medicine operates from a paradigm that I think is incorrect, which is Sjogren's is different than alopecia. And I don't think it's really that different. You know, it's immune cells reacting against parts of the body. And why are those immune cells doing something that they're not supposed to be doing? It's the same sort of, it's the same sort of root mechanism 
in the end. And so that's, I think, challenging is that if you were going to do a study, would you just have Sjogren's patients and you're another page study with MS patients, another study with rheumatoid arthritis, another study with type 1 diabetes, another study with autoimmune alopecia, right? It gets it gets just onerous and and who funds it? So I think that, that that's a problem, but it's based on our flawed thinking around these conditions in medicine. And if, if Western medical paradigm began to see them as what they are, I think often caused by the same things, it would make it much easier for people to think, oh, let's start with food. I mean, that's a really quote easy. I mean, behavioral change is not easy for everyone, but this is an easy, uh, low, low impact, um, zero side effect intervention that we should always do. And I think that's, that's what got me interested in this whole thing was my autoimmune disease. And I think that that's where so many people will benefit is their autoimmune conditions that are just not getting better just by intentionally looking at their diet. I think that's so powerful. Wonderfully said, Paul. All right. I appreciate you're... it. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Ben. I was just going to ask Paul if he was to recommend, um, you know, a supplement that could really help support you in, you know, potentially clearing up nutrient deficiencies and supporting the organs that support immune system function, which one he'd recommend there so we can get him hooked up with our Kerr team and get him and get him sorted. Yeah, histamine and immune. Start with histamine and immune. I think I'm I'm really excited about thymus yeah. these days. Um, and there's a lot of evidence about the involutions, kind of the atrophy of the thymus as we age. And and I don't think it needs to happen. I think it's just sort of one of the things that we accept as normal in medicine, like rising blood pressure. But there's evidence that desiccated thymus actually helps, I think at least in animal models, helps with thymic atrophy and can improve overall. Uh, immune function as the thymus doesn't atrophy as much. We don't know as much in humans, but mechanistically, it makes a lot of sense to me. So I would start with histamine and immune from that perspective, or really, I think that histamine and immune would be a great one to start with for, for most any autoimmune condition. Awesome. Thank you, doctor. And thank you, Ben, for calling in. And last but certainly not least, we have Catalina from Texas who wants to know all about headaches. So Catalina, what is the story and how might we help you? Hi, I have, actually have a few questions, um, but yeah, one of them is around my headaches. I, I started it about seven days ago, the animal-based feeding, and I've noticed some more frequent headaches than usual. Um, I did see, you know, some people posting about using, you know, some salt in your water, it might be dehydration, not enough water. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. I don't want to add too much salt because um, I do add it to my food, but um, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. The other two questions I had was around eating too much red meat. Is, is it bad for you? Um, and then the last question I had was around an using antibiotics or steroids for sinus infections. How does that hinder your animal-based eating? And what can you do to okay. prevent gut issues? Or yeah, yeah. That's so how many, how many carbohydrates are you eating per day? Do you have a sense now? I don't have a sense. I, I know I do usually eat like a big bowl of fruit with my meals. I probably eat um, two, two full meals a day and then some fruit in between. Um, but I, I, I haven't really counted the carbs intake. Which, which kind of, what kind of fruit are you eating? M mostly uh, berries and oranges, berries, oranges, and bananas. Okay. Okay. I, I, the first thought would be increase the carbohydrates. Um, I think that a lot of people, when they transition to, when they transition to animal based, they're used to getting more carbohydrates from oatmeal or bread or grains. And we're not really used to eating a lot of fruit or a lot of honey or maple syrup or raw milk with lactose or something with the carbohydrates. But I think that increasing the carbohydrates, either by fruit juice, adding honey to anything you're drinking, if you're doing raw milk or milk, adding honey to that or maple syrup, doing a little more fruit or, or the fruit juice, I think will help out a lot because it, I, I just, I wonder if that's, that's the issue going on with the headaches. Generally speaking, um, an animal-based diet shouldn't cause headaches. People who have a history of headaches find improvements with things like riboflavin, which is in heart and liver. So making sure you're getting some organs is probably also a good idea, but it sounds like this isn't necessarily a migraine type physiology. Um, also, we know from research by Chris Ramsden and his group at NIH that eliminating seed oils and omega-6 fatty acids is going to significantly improve migraineous headaches and those type of conditions. So the first thing I would say is don't fear the carbohydrates and, and maybe just think like, was I eating oatmeal and rice and pasta and bread? And is it possible that I've just cut my carbohydrates in half um, and, and that's 
mm -hmm. your body is adjusting to. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that's um, something you want to lean into. I would, I would increase the carbohydrates because that'll again, support um, keeping cortisol at bay and keeping your thyroid where you want it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And then your, your second question was red meat. So, so my podcast is called Fundamental Health. I've done a lot of podcasts on red meat and whether it's harmful for humans. And so uh, the answer high level is no. I don't, think, I don't think eating a lot of red meat is going to be harmful for humans. But, and, and that's not, not cancer, not arthritis, not cardiovascular disease, not gout. Uh, there's good evidence that there's really no evidence for any of that, no matter how you look at it. Those are all kind of uh, unique rabbit holes to go down, but I wouldn't eating. I wouldn't worry about eating red meat and organs. Now, if you want to mix in some other meat, that's fine. But generally, the association there is either with heme iron, uh, which is going to be present in dark meat chicken as well as red meat, or with saturated fat. And there's tons of good evidence that saturated fats in animal foods, like stearic acid, are very beneficial for humans. And Stearic acid is probably actually a very positive estrogen modulator in humans. It seems to block um, aromatase as well and, and block the estrogen receptor, which are things that both men and women want because excess estrogen looks to be harmful. So stearic acid is a very valuable saturated fat that's predominantly found in animal foods. So saturated fat is not harmful for humans. Um, there is a little bit of confusion there because when we do less polyunsaturated fatty acids, uh, AKA seed oils and more saturated fat, LDL will often rise slightly, 20, 30%. But uh, as I've talked about many times in the past, LDL by itself is a very poor predictor of cardiovascular disease and can only be interpreted in the context of insulin resistance and overall, I would say, uh, lipid health. What we know is that if you decrease saturated fat and increase seed oils or polyunsaturated fat, you end up with less LDL, but more oxidized LDL and more LP little a. LP little a being a subfraction of LDL that is very strongly implicated in cardiovascular disease because it seems to mop up oxidized phospholipids. The gist of this, the high level, is that even if your LDL goes down when you're eating seed oils, you're getting more of those LDL particles damaged, which is a problem. And even if your LDL goes up when you have more animal fat, less of those LDL particles are damaged, which is what you want to do. So I wouldn't worry about eating too much red meat as long as you're getting enough organs along with it. And we talked earlier in this podcast about the sort of where you want to think about your protein amount. And I would think one gram or actually for a woman, 0 0.9, 0 0.8 grams per pound of gold body weight. So you may not even need to eat that much red meat if you're getting um, protein from other sources like cheese or milk and things like that. Um, and then your third question was around steroids and antibiotics for a sinus infection. So um, I'm, I'm not yeah. a fan of steroids. And, and that that's a problem. So one of the things we talked about a couple of times in this podcast was the dangers of cortisol. And when you take steroids, you're essentially increasing your cortisol. So that's that's not a good thing. Um, what, what doctors will do is often prescribe steroids when the in, immune and the inflammatory reaction in the sinuses gets out of hand. But I think that that's going to lead to um, more harm than good in the long term, and I would not do steroids. I don't think nasal steroids are a good thing. There's both inhaled nasal steroids like Flonase or oral steroids, which are going to be problematic. Um, I think that you, it, um, antibiotics are also problematic depending on what type of antibiotic you're using um, for the sinus infection. I guess it depends how serious it is, and it makes me think like, how did the sinus infection happen in the first place? Sometimes these things are needed in the acute phase to fix it, but it does, especially the steroids, I would be very careful about those. Um, taking antibiotics is probably going to lead to some rehabilitation need in the gut long-term and it can lead to some imbalances. But the overarching question that I think you need to ask yourself um, is, is why did I get a sinus infection in the first place? What's out of balance uh, in my diet, in what I'm doing in my life that, that I'm getting the sinus infection? Um, other people in my family have had recurrent sinus infections and they, they tend to happen when they're stressed and underslept and under nutrient, you know, under nutrified by their diet. So I think there's an indication there that there's some things to work on, um, in, in, in the whole, the whole overarching, uh, picture of, of your life. Is, is that helpful? Does that answer your question sort of? Yeah, it does. Do you have any recommendations for sinuses, sinus issues like that to prevent that? Yeah. So, uh, or well, is it just really better sleep. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, making sure your thyroid is good, getting enough vitamin D, being in the sun or supplementing with vitamin D um, because vitamin D is kind of central for all of this. We've learned that in the last few years with 
um, the overarching sort of viral mm -hmm. issues in the population. So vitamin D is critical. Thyroid, making sure you're getting enough carbohydrates, getting making sure you're getting enough nutrients and sleep. And then if you're having recurrent sinus issues, thinking about whether this is an allergic thing that's causing constant congestion and maybe something like histamine and immune or mm -hmm. thymus or kidney would be helpful. And some, you know, some of these things, uh, looking if it's an allergic issue, looking at how to address the allergic issue. If it's a if it's sinus congestion, I think then you have to look at allergens in your home, the sheets, um, mold or mites, uh, you know, things like that, that can be a little tricky. Um, Austin has a lot of moldy or I forget where you are. If, if you're in Texas or somewhere else, a lot of mold and buildings and things like that, that people can be exposed to. There's always the problem. There's always the possibility of using like a saline rinse in your nose, which is much more benign than a, than a steroid or an antibiotic also like a neti pot or something just to start and, and then kind of going from there. But I think, um, what we do in Western medicine is we look at your nose and we go, how do we address that? But I wish what we did is we go, hmm, let's look at your whole, uh, let's look at the whole framework, which is of course mm -hmm. more, more um, involved for you, but that's how we prevent the recurrence and actually get to the root cause. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I think the health guides at Heart and Soil can help, you know, uh, moving forward. If you have more issues and stuff, we can probably help walk you through it. Thanks. Thank you, Catalina. We will huck it up over here. And just to remember as well that we got to play the long game a little bit here. You said you're only a couple of weeks into this journey. Um, things will start trending upwards. Uh, there is just literally thousands of anecdotes at this point from people adopting this way of eating that used to deal with chronic headaches and chronic sinus infections. They were getting sick five, six, seven times a year. And that becomes significantly less so as we heal the body, as we start to find balance homeostasis, as we nutrify you and put those good nutritions back in and uh, we keep that stress low. So take a look at it holistically, keep going with the diet, you know, take those um, solutions and, and get in a little more carbohydrates there and check your electrolytes, keep stress low and just keep going because I promise you don't, don't quit on it now. You're, you're very close and a couple of weeks from now, you'll be feeling a million bucks. So thanks for calling in Catalina. And uh, Paul, that that's it for our for our callers in, man. I appreciate the heck out of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Do you have any closing thoughts? Can you see any any kind of reoccurring themes to those calls? Anything that you want to say before we start wrapping this baby up? Yeah, I think that um, carbohydrates are a recurring theme here. Yeah. Uh, it's it's so interesting, and I get it. I mean, I was part of a carnivore movement for a long time, and and I think a lot of my audience that's found heart and soil fears carbohydrates, but yeah. I just want people to know that um, they're your friend when they're from the right sources. And the reason they're your friend is because they are a signal to the body that there is abundance mm. and that stress is low. And, and to limit them gives the body the opposite signal, scarcity, high stress, which leads to cortisol increasing, which leads to gut permeability, which leads to thyroid impairment. And, and those are all, that's what you don't want to have happen. So don't fear the carbohydrates. Um, carbohydrates don't cause insulin resistance. Even in diabetics, you can have a lot of honey um, you know, it, and it's, it's going to improve overall insulin sensitivity. I think we often also get too myopic looking at our blood glucose levels. And this is kind of a, a, a nuanced thing that I'll just talk about briefly that I've talked about more on my podcast. We use fasting glucose to diagnose diabetes, but I think that we've been told to fear blood sugar too much. And though I think continuous glucose monitors and these type of things that give us a real time sense of our blood glucose are valuable, I think they've also created a little bit of um, fear in people. And we'll see postprandial glucose levels that are high, or we'll do a finger stick glucose after a meal and see a 140 or 150 or even a 120 and get worried about that. And those are completely normal and super healthy and valuable for humans. So I don't worry about your postprandial glucose levels unless they're above 220, you know, or even 200 or, or 300, like that's, that's pathological. But even a blood glucose level of 160 after a meal is, is really not that big a deal for a human, especially if it comes back to normal. And, and I've talked about this in my podcast many times. There's good studies that look at the glycemic index and the glycemic load of foods, and there's really no correlation with these and overall uh, health outcomes in humans or cardiovascular disease outcomes. So we, I think from the right place, We've been taught to fear carbohydrates, but we don't need to fear carbohydrates any longer. 
Um, we're getting such nutrient-rich foods with meat and organs that if we give our body the signal of abundance with carbohydrates, we will thrive. And it's, I think a lot of people get the piece around meat and organs, but the hardest thing for people to do right now seems to be giving their body enough of an abundance signal with mm. adequate carbohydrates. Yeah, I think that's a really nice way to put a bow on it. And if we could kind of distill that down to one thing, it's the stress, right? You said this lack and chronic lack of carbohydrate signals there is no abundance. It's scarcity. And we just know that bodies don't thrive when they're overstressed. You know, stress is anti-metabolic and we want to be pro-metabolism. We want to get people thriving in their bodies, in the minds. You know, we, we, our awareness is carried inside of this body. And if it's, it's under stress, it narrows our bandwidth of what we can see. So it, it comes out so much more holistic when we signal abundance, when we eat foods that provide abundance and we keep that stress low from a nutritional perspective and from a lifestyle perspective. So thank you so much, Dr. Paul. We're going to link in the show notes to the podcast that you mentioned about myths around saturated fat and red meat, et cetera. Um, just um, a closing invite to share where people can go to find you, um, your online channels, the name of your podcast, et cetera. Podcast is called Fundamental Health and you can find me on Instagram at carnivoremd2.0. I've also got a website, which is carnivoremd.com. Thank you, Paul. Really appreciate you, brother. Yeah. Thank you, guys. That was fun. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Radical Health Radio. We want you to call into the show. So please head over to RadicalHealthRadio.com and there you will find instructions on how to be a part of our show and get your questions answered live. We hope this has been incredibly valuable to you. And if it has, please follow, like, subscribe, and leave us a review on your podcast platform. It helps us spread this message of radical health. We'll see you every Wednesday with new episodes. Big love, radical health seekers. See you soon. Mm -hmm.